Welcome students to chapter 9 in which we'll discuss molecular geometry and bonding theories. Many years ago a good childhood friend of mine uh, worked in Jackson Hole, Wyoming together over the summer. During the daytime we each worked cleaning rooms in a local hotel and then at night we worked uh, at, the, at a restaurant. I was uh, the dishwasher and, and he was a busboy. Currently he now has a PhD in uh, gene therapy and I, I think uh, is going to become a professor, a professional researcher. I haven't corresponded with him in quite a while. We made the observation that, um, well, the somewhat scientific observation, that anything with string-like properties has the natural tendency to become tangled. For example, extension cords, chains, string itself, uh, or, you know, any other kind of wire or cord, if you just let it sit there on its own, it generally has the tendency to, of, to get tangled. We uh, dubbed this uh, observation to be the law of string. Okay, it's not an actual scientific law, but sometimes when I see something get tangled or I see something get stuck on something else in an annoying and obnoxious way, I always blame the law of string. Before beginning, I'd like to introduce you to a fun fact. Okay, it's not really that fun, but I think it's very cool. And that is the definition of the term IC50 value. I only tell it to you, my students, because uh, for those of you who go into medicine, you guys might encounter IC50 value as a value that uh, helps portray a medicine's potency. So just so you know, a medicine's IC50 value is a measure of how much of that medicine is required to, dis to decrease an unwanted symptom by 50%. For example, the IC50 value of paclitaxel, which is known commercially as Taxol, among other names, uh, against several human cancer cell lines is 2.5 to 7.5 nanomolar. This means that a patient with a specific type of cancer would, in theory, have to maintain a taxol tissue concentration of 2.5 to 7.5 nanomoles per liter, for however many liters of blood that patient has, of this drug to effectively inhibit the cancer by 50%. Now I want to show you something entertaining. Two different chemistry cats of the day from quipmeme.com. How often do I make chemistry jokes? Periodically. <laughs> and if it's a periodic table, then what is it the rest of the time? <laughs> now I'll introduce you to today's lineup. After this lecture or series of presentations, which will cover sections 1 through 3 of chapter 9 of our text, you should be able to do the following. First, use Lewis structures to predict molecules' shapes and bond angles. Second, know the difference between bonding pairs and electron domains. Third, identify and contrast a molecule's electron domain geometry with its molecular geometry. And fourth, use Lewis structures to predict whether or not a molecule will be polar. We'll tackle some of these in this video and then others in subsequent videos. Let's go ahead and get started by introducing you to the idea that molecules' shapes matter. According to our text, Lewis structures help us understand the compositions of molecules and their covalent bonds. However, Lewis structures do not show one of the most important aspects of molecules, their overall shapes. The shape and size of a molecule together with its strength and polarity of its bonds largely determine its properties. For example, the chapter opening photograph in this chapter in our book in chapter 9 shows a molecular model of diazepam, which is better known as Valium. Valium works by binding to certain important sites in the central nervous system. Its effectiveness is highly dependent on the shape and size of the molecule as well as the charge distributions within it. Even a small modification to the molecular shape or size will alter the drug's effectiveness. So if shapes of molecules matter, we need to learn how to predict what those shapes are going to be. Now, generally speaking, molecules adopt the shape that keeps all of the atoms around a central atom as far apart or as spaced out from each other as possible. For example, in the molecule carbon tetrachloride, whose Lewis structure without all the lone pairs on the chlorines is shown here, the furthest apart that the four chlorine atoms can get on a flat two-dimensional surface like this screen is 90 degrees. However, in real life, we don't live in a two-dimensional world like this flat screen you're staring at. Molecules exist in a three-dimensional world where each of these four chlorine atoms can actually spread out a little bit further than 90 degrees like this. Okay, this might be a little bit difficult to uh, see, but what this is trying to do is show you three-dimensionally speaking that in real life carbon tetrachloride has its central carbon atom like this, and each of these chlorines is poking out a little bit further than 90 degrees because it's not flat. 
They're poking out three-dimensionally as this model attempts to depict. The angle between each of these groups is 109.5 degrees. I'll show you that right now in a handheld model. So this is a cute little handheld model. Once again, you can see that this carbon atom, which is depicted as a black sphere, is surrounded by four individual chlorine atoms in this molecule of carbon tetrachloride, or CCl4. As I was just explaining, you can get in real life, in the three-dimensional world, each of these chlorine atoms to be further apart from each other than 90 degrees, as would be the case if you were only in a two-dimensional world. So this would be the overall shape that we would see in carbon tetrachloride. Now, this type of shape is called a tetrahedron. You can see that the chlorines, which are the green balls in this uh, picture, can spread out from their central carbon atom to have about a 109.5 degree angle between each chlorine atom. So this idea, the idea that atoms spread out as far apart from each other as possible, is called the VSEPR, or valence shell electron pair repulsion model. Sometimes I just like to call it VSEPR because it rolls off the tongue a little bit easier than VSEPR. This brings us to a beautiful lecture question. I want you to draw the Lewis structure of water, then determine the molecule's overall shape. Now I'd like you to pause the video right here and attempt to do this on your own. After doing so, you can press play and I'll show you the answer. This question asks us to draw the Lewis structure of water and then determine its shape. As I discussed in an earlier video, to determine a, the Lewis structure of a compound, we first will write out the compound's formula, H2O, and we determine how many valence electrons each of the atoms in that molecule has. As you should recognize, each hydrogen has one valence electron, and there are two of them, and oxygen, being in group 6A of the periodic table, has six. Therefore, the total number of valence electrons we have to play with in this molecule is eight. Now what I have to do is establish the bonding pattern. It should be obvious that oxygen is going to be the central atom and it's going to be bonded to two individual hydrogen atoms as seen there. Unlike the uh, elements of the periodic table past row two, hydrogen only needs two electrons, so at this point each of those hydrogen atoms is fulfilled. I'll take my remaining electrons of my eight and I'll put them here. I now count up the total num number of electrons I've laid out in this uh, Lewis structure. I've got two, four, six, eight. I've used all of my electrons, and uh, then I ask myself, does everything here feel like it has an octet, or in the case of hydrogen, that it has a two-tet? The answer is yes, so this is the correct Lewis structure for that molecule. The next thing this question asks is for us to determine the shape of this molecule. In order to look at that, we have to look more closely at this central atom, oxygen. It has actually four things around it. It has a hydrogen to the right, hydrogen to the left, a set of lone pairs, and another set of lone pairs. If you're going to have four things around a central atom, let's see if we can take a look at a model and determine a little bit more clearly what that geometry is going to look like. Much like we had in our earlier example of carbon tetrachloride, in the case of water, H2O, I have a central atom with four things around it. Unlike the carbon tetrachloride, not all four of those things are atoms. One of those things is a hydrogen, another is a hydrogen, and then the other two things are each one set of lone pair electrons. So I'm going to use this same central atom that I used before, except this time this represents our oxygen atom, not a carbon atom, as was the case earlier. It's now going to be bonded to two different hydrogens, and it doesn't really matter where I put them. I'll go ahead and put one there and one right there. If we look at that, you might ask, what is the shape of that? Well, this uh, is supposed to represent the end of where one of those lone pairs, so this would be one lone pair. This is another lone pair with no atom at the end of it. And then each of these is a set of uh, bonding pairs being, uh, or connecting the central oxygen to each hydrogen. So what is the shape of this thing? Well, if you're counting the lone pairs as contributing to the shape, then you would call that tetrahedral, just as is the case with the uh, carbon tetrachloride. If you're not counting those, in other words, if we could imagine us ignoring these uh, lone pairs and just looking at what's left, then I would count uh, or call this shape bent. You'll know, notice it looks like a bent shape. So this type of shape, the one in which we count all of the atoms and ignore the lone pairs and don't consider the lone pairs as contributing to the geometry, is called the molecular geometry. The shape of the uh, water molecule and its molecular geometry is bent. If, however, we count everything, including the lone pairs, uh, as contributing to the geometry, then the overall shape is considered tetrahedral. This type of uh, geometry, the one in which we count the lone pairs, is called electron domain geometry.